Welcome to Where Are They Now? We reach into the archives of Lenape, Shawnee, Cherokee, and Seneca High Schools and invite selected alumni to share memories and fill us in on their career paths after commencement. Since Lenape's first graduating class in 1961, Shawnee's in 1972, Cherokee's in 1978, and Seneca's in 2005, over 75,000 individuals have received diplomas from these four schools. Hello and welcome to another edition of Where Are They Now? I'm Mark Sancini, a 1996 graduate of Cherokee High School, and today we'll be talking with a Shawnee alumna from the class of 2002. She is an educational consultant residing in Hampstead, North Carolina. I'd like to welcome Jennifer O'Donnell Brysocker to the show. Jennifer, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. All right, let's start off by talking about some of the uh, staff members that had an impact on you at your time at Shawnee. Um, first off, Elisa and Rusty Williams uh, had an impact on you. Tell us uh, why they were special to you. So they are still dear friends to me to this day. Um, Rusty actually baptized both of my children and my husband, believe it or not. Oh, wow. But um, we had a very core group of us. Uh, we, I was a senior during 9-11. And anybody who was teaching at Shawnee and remembers at 9-11, we did a card drive that we got the information from all of the first responders that died in the attacks. Okay. And students were able to go at lunch, pick out a name, and fill out a card for their families. And then the core group of us that worked on that uh, went up to New York to deliver them. And it was an experience that I will never forget. I will keep it with me forever. And we've stayed incredibly close because of that all these years. Yeah, that must have been incredible. Tell tell us about what that was like. Uh, you know, going up there. How how soon after the attacks were you? Did you go up there? We went up in November, um, so two months later. It was surreal. I remember it being the only place ever in New York City that was silent. Mm -hmm. um, you would just hear, you know, construction equipment and whatnot. Um, we were with a lot of police officers from our area as well, and they went down into the rubble to kind of look at it. The rest of us were a block of way. Okay. Um, I was just short of being 18 or else I would have been able to go down on my own accord, but yeah. I just missed that. But, you know, we tried to take pictures and take it in. And um, I remember specifically the the missing posters of all of yeah. the different people that were just plastered. The things you see on the news, but then you see it in person and it just it stays with you forever. Sure. What an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. um, you were a uh, self-described photo kid at Shawnee. Uh, yep. So Mr. Mike Yurko, Mr. Craig Wigley were a part of that. Tell us about that. I, I, there is no way to describe being a photo kid at Shawnee. I did all three years. Um, ironically enough, I was in photo class when 9-11 happened. So it kind of brought us all, we were a tight knit group anyway, it brought yeah. us all together a little bit more too. But just um, the friendships we made in there and they were both fantastic teachers and uh, we all just developed this love of just taking pictures and seeing what's out there. And I still love nature and landscape photography today because of what I learned in those classes. And uh, this, the friendships that were in there, we still have today. It was just, it was a fantastic experience. Great. And Mr. Greg O'Brien, uh, you had for writing and Christine yes. Lorenz that you had for history. Tell us about them. I don't think you can uh, put Mr. O'Brien into words. <laughs> he was probably one of the most unique teachers I had ever had, and I absolutely loved him. But I knew I didn't want to do that as a career, just going in as an English major, which is going to be a lot more than I knew or that I wanted to um, to kind of work through. Okay. But uh, Miss Lorenz, I had her for two years. You know, there was a pregnancy in there as well. I don't even want to think about how old her kids are now. Um, <laughs> but she was a phenomenal history teacher and I fell in love with history. Her long-term sub was Mr. Mann. He was also a phenomenal history teacher and it made me love history in a way that nobody had ever like engulfed that in me before and it was because of them that I decided I wanted to be a history teacher. Yeah, I was going to ask you, um, you know, how much them and, and some of your other teachers, um, how much they played into the fact that, you know, in your career in, into becoming an educator, which we'll, we'll talk about more in a little bit, but, um, yeah. you know, what, what was it? Was there anything specific that, you know, they did that, was it the way they connected with you or, or what was it that really made you say, this is something that I want to do? 
I think they were kind of groundbreaking with how they taught. I mean, it was still very lecture based and everything as education was at the time. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of, you know, hands on and group work and, and projects and stuff that I hadn't really seen before. And they just explained things in a way that made sense to me. Okay. Um, I know even talking about teachers, I always struggled in math. Like I've always joked around that I'm fortunate that I can count. Um, <laughs> but Mrs. McGinley I had in ninth grade. And I remember at one point I had the highest average in the class because I understood the way she taught. So okay. it really just all of those teachers together made me realize the type of teacher that I wanted to be and that uh -huh. I aspired to be. And of course, I stumbled along the way, but I feel like by the end of my actual in the classroom career, I had it figured out. Very good. Um, some of the activities you were involved in at Shawnee you were uh, in cheerleading for mm -hmm. two different seasons, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Football and basketball, uh, student council, National Honor Society. Uh, what do you remember about those? It's what made high school, you know, I, just being able to have the practice and and go to the games and then be a part of student council was so huge at Shawnee. And I remember that I just uh, threw up my hands. Somebody came in and said, is anybody interested in being homeroom rep? And I hadn't really heard about it before, but I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll run. And a couple people did. And then they picked me and I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> but it was it was a fun experience and something that I might not have, you know, done in any other capacity and it got me into especially like when I went into college I was part of student government and I was very big in the student activities board and it kind of all snowballed from those experiences that I had at Shawnee. And another experience uh, at Shawnee that we can't forget to talk about you met your future husband Sean who was also uh, in the class of 2002. Um, I did. How did you guys meet? When did you meet and how did that all happen? So ironically enough throughout high school we had very many similar friends, but our paths never crossed. Okay. Um, by senior year, I knew he was like the cute kid in the hockey jersey, and he knew that I was the cute girl in the <laughs> cheerleading uniform. <laughs> okay. But we still like never really talked. Um, and then it was the end of senior year. If anybody from the class of 2002 is listening, you probably recall that within like a week, everybody had a prom date. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, <laughs> everybody had a prom date, and I was supposed to go with somebody, and he was supposed to go with somebody, and both of them fell through. Okay. So a friend of ours, mutual friend, said just like off the cuff, "Oh, you guys should go together," not knowing that both of us, you know, had eyes for the other. Right. Because <laughs> nobody really knew that. Um, so he asked me to prom, and that was that. <laughs> Very cool. Interesting how things yeah. work out sometimes. Yeah, so we, we did have a slight hiatus um, during our college years, so we laugh okay. now that we've been dating for, or dating, we've been together for 18 years, just three of them we were seeing other people. Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> it worked out, so I guess it's okay. Right. Um, any of those friends that you, uh, you guys still keep in touch with from Shawnee? We do. We keep a, he had a very tight-knit group, and again, I was friends with all of them as well, so we still get together and many have kids now and you know we've moved to North Carolina one of our good friends has moved to Tennessee you know okay. we're we're all over the place but I know like the boys go on a golf trip every year together still nice. you know whether it's local to the Northeast this past year they went to California so they cool. you know they still make it happen very nice so after your graduation from Shawnee you go to Monmouth University for your mm -hmm. undergrad in history and education um, was it was it right at that time at Shawnee, that's when you decided you wanted to be a teacher? I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. What kind of teacher, I didn't know until I finally made that transition into college and decided I wanted to be history. Gotcha. Okay. Um, at Monmouth, you were in uh, Student Activities Board, uh, Student mm -hmm. Government, uh, Sorority. Tell us about those. Um, so... My freshman year, I kind of laid low a little bit, just trying to get my bearings. And then me and my best friend, who ended up being my maid of honor at my wedding, decided that we were going to go join something. So we went to the Student Activities Board office, and they said, we have this comedy chair position open. If you guys want to be comedy co-chairs, why not? So right. we brought the comedians into campus and did all of that. And then what it, the way it works at Monmouth is once you're kind of in that um, student leader type group, you yeah. wind up being in everything. Okay. So you know, I was a, a general senator, I think, for a little bit for student government. Um, I'm a founder of my uh, chapter of my sorority there, Alpha Z Delta. I was a white rose for the founders of the Sigma Tau Gamma fraternity. Uh, okay. You know, there is just a lot of a lot of interlocking pieces there that you know we were all friends and we were all doing the same thing. So it was it was a good time. 
Great. Uh, and then after you graduate there, you go right into teaching? Yes. So it took a little bit of time. That was right around the time that um, it started becoming difficult to find a teaching job. So up okay. until that point, everybody was like, oh, teachers, there's always in demand. But, but, but that was right around the time where people started not wanting to retire or, you right. know, so it took a little bit of time. Um, but I did end up getting my first job with my first interview that I had, which was at um, the West Windsor Plainsboro School District in Jersey. Okay. And you taught uh, high school history for 11 years, correct? Yes. So I taught at West Windsor for seven years. And then I left there because um, we had had two babies at that point. I was commuting all the way up to West Windsor. My husband was commuting into Philadelphia every day. And we were mm. leaving the kids far away every yeah. day. So I ended up finding a job at BCIT in West Hampton, which was okay. a six minute commute. So I made that switch. Much easier. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, so what did you, what was your favorite part about um, high school teaching? Like teaching high school? Yes. I love the aha moment. I think every teacher, no matter what grade you teach, will say that when you see a kid get it or they understand it or you're trying to teach them something in a certain way and all of a sudden it clicks, it makes everything worth it. And I mean, even now that I've moved on to training teachers, when I see the aha moment, it's the yeah. exact same feeling all over again. Is that something you can kind of plan for and try, you know, it, it works nope. something in there and tr this is this is going to get them or it just kind of happens on its own when it happens. I mean, you can certainly try your hardest. You know, I don't think any teacher goes in there and is like, well, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, you try right. to plan out something that's going to make it click. But when you see it click and yeah. you don't ever know when that's going to be, it's sure. just it's worth it. Yeah. Excellent. Um, OK, so then in 2010, you go back for your master's uh, mm -hmm. in public service leadership. Uh, tell us about what that involved and, and what you were kind of thinking at that point in time. So I did an online master's before it was cool. Um, <laughs> I knew I didn't, you know, with, I had my first child at the time and I didn't want to be going to school at night if I didn't have to. And I was yeah. coaching as well. Um, I coached cheerleading for a number of years. I am now retired. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I knew I wanted to try to do it from home. So I found this program. Um, at that time, I wasn't 100% sure if I wanted to stay in the classroom. It was right at that tipping point that most teachers get of do I want to try to do something else or do I want to stay here doing this? Okay. So when I found this program, Public Service Leadership, I sort of felt like it was a big enough umbrella that if I did want to stay in the classroom, it was fine. But if I wanted to move on to something different, it covered that as well. Okay. Um, so that's the program that I decided to go with. Okay. And eventually you did decide to kind of move on into something different, and that is becoming an educational consultant. Um, tell us kind of what that involves and why you made that change. So um, when I was working in my first school district, they came out probably three or four years into me teaching there saying that they wanted everybody to move to this student-centered model of education. But we didn't really have enough guidance on what that actually looked like. They just kept saying, we'll make things student centered. And mm -hmm. we didn't understand what that meant. But I knew the way that I always taught is I would do the traditional lecture and then I'd had the kids do some type of a project. And I always saw that when they were hands on and doing projects, things went really well. So I said, I'm not going to be the one to just shut my door and nod my head. I want to try to figure this out. Okay. Um, so while I was there, I was trying to piece it together. And then once I moved to BCIT and they found out that I had a background in understanding what this is, they kind of gave me free reign to try whatever I wanted to try, which I will be forever thankful for. So after my time there, um, I'd say it probably took about five years for me to really hone in on what student-centered learning looks like okay. and a model that works for no matter you know what group of students you have, age group, level, it works for them. So I started doing workshops on that you know, within the district. Um, I got called up to the state level at one point uh, to talk about a blended learning course that we were running. Okay. And a lot of people are like, do you want to be an administrator? You should really be an administrator. And I said, that's not for me. That's not what I want to do. But I really started liking giving workshops. And when I told people that, they were like, that's what you need to do. You need to go out there and explain to people this method, how you do it, take your workshop on the road, if you want to think of it that way. Uh -huh. um, so at, at the end of the school year in 2018, I left BCIT and I went all in on my business that trains teachers on how to completely adjust to a 100% student-centered model. Okay. And that business is Student-Centered World. 
as you said, in 2018. Um, and basically, uh, you have a bunch of different things uh, in that. We, we see you in your podcast studio. You have a podcast mm -hmm. that you offer. You also, Tell us about some of the other uh, tools that you offer for teachers uh, to kind of help them uh, with this student-centered approach. Sure. So I have my podcast, like you said. Um, I have a website where I'm constantly putting up new articles about data that I've found or, you know, different ideas that you can use, that you can try. And again, I try to make it very K-12 centric, which sounds hard because you teach a kindergartner very differently than you would teach a 12th grader. Right. But you use the same concepts. You just, the content is a little bit different. Okay. Um, my main thing, well, I also have um, social media and I'm constantly talking to teachers, finding out what their pain points are and what I can help with. But my main thing is my course that I run um, that again, takes teachers from having no knowledge or some knowledge, or I've heard of student-centered learning, but I don't get it. And it walks them through step-by-step. Step. And the unique part about my course that I did very intentionally was as you work through the course, you're actually lesson planning because okay. there's nothing that I would hate worse than going to a workshop where they would talk about all the theory or how great something was. And you'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. but then they wouldn't give you any time to work on it or ask questions. Okay. And then you'd go home and it would be business as usual. So right. as you work through my class, which is online, um, by the time you're done, you're ready to implement it into your classroom immediately. Okay. And we said you started this in 2018 and mm -hmm. uh, probably unknowingly to you at the time, it was very good timing because we mm -hmm. know what happened in 2020. Um, right. How has the whole COVID situation affected um, you know, what you're doing and, and how you're helping teachers learn how to teach not only students that approach, but do it online as well, right? So student-centered learning, the way that I teach it, the way that I have found that it works, has a very, very large blended component to it. So all of a sudden when people started freaking out saying, how am I supposed to do stuff online? I don't understand what blended or hybrid learning is. How am I supposed to do distance learning? I mm. realized I have exactly what it is that you're looking for. Yeah. And I've been doing it now for a little while. So March, I wanna say 20th ish, I started a Facebook group and I was just telling people, please come in, let's talk, let's try to come up with ideas because that's when the schools all shut down and went to distance learning. And yeah. there were some people that had never not stood in front of a classroom and lectured. And now they're trying to figure out how to do it online. And you cannot teach online or blended the way that you would teach in the classroom. So if you could give one tip for a teacher who's uh, you know, struggling with, with online learning right now, what would, what would be the best thing for them to start with? So obviously if you go to my website, I've got a lot of articles and I think one of the e easiest ways to start off trying to figure out what to do is to kind of read up on it and let it, you know, digest a little bit. I have a whole bunch of podcasts coming up this season where I'm interviewing teachers in the field. Um, one of my first interviews of the season was a girl who had joined our Facebook group in the spring, who at that time had said that she had more time on her hands now that she was all digital because she had already been doing all of this stuff in the classroom. So it kind of explained like how she did that. Um, but I'm very open and willing to chat with anybody. And I know at some point that's going to be to my detriment, <laughs> but I tell people all the time, find me on social media, send me a message. You can vent, we can come up with a plan. We can do something together because making this switch isn't difficult. It's just a mindset shift. And if nobody has explained it to you before, it just seems completely overwhelming. Yeah. So for a teacher out there who wants to get in touch with you, where can they find you? So um, I'm on Instagram at Student Centered World, same as for Facebook. My website is studentcenteredworld.com. You can go on there. And then if you want to just, you know, type a whole lot of things quickly, <laughs> as I know <laughs> teachers like to do, admin at studentcenteredworld.com. You can get me through email. Terrific. Uh, let's talk about your family and some of your interests outside of work a little bit. You mentioned, <laughs> well, we talked about your, your husband, Sean. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned your two babies. Tell us about your son, Zachary and Carson. Yes, Zachary is nine years old, almost 10, and Carson just turned seven. They are the most energetic and crazy children that I have ever met <laughs> in my entire life. But I also hear that boys get easier as they get older. So I'm holding everybody to that <laughs> who has said that to me. Um, they're fantastic, though. They, they love life. Um, they love our animals. They love sports. 
They are, if you know Sean and I, they are mini versions of Sean and I. Zach <laughs> is a mini version of me, and Carson is a mini version of Sean. It's just... It's funny how that works it's sometimes. It's funny how that works. Yep, yep. <laughs> you guys like going to the beach and uh, are into boat racing. Tell me about this. Yeah. All right, so first off, we moved to North Carolina so we can live right by the beach. Um, it's always been kind of a goal of ours. It took almost 10 years, but we finally made it down here, and we absolutely love it. Um, but, yeah, my husband's family races boats, um, little kneel-down outboards, so we travel all over the place doing that. So my husband still races. You're allowed to start racing at 9. So Zachary, okay. all winter long, worked on his race boat. And then, of course, COVID came. So almost every race was canceled. Is he building but, it himself? Um, so we got a, a boat that somebody had given us from okay. a boat racer that had actually passed away years ago. So it was just sitting. Okay. So they gave it to us. And then not far from us is another boat racer who builds boats. So they spent many weekends over the summer. And I mean, he was there with the hammer and the sanding and, and you know, got nice. it all figured out. I love my cricket. So I lettered it all up for him <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's ready to go. So we did, we were able to go out uh, so he could test it. Then we found out that there was a little tweak that we have to make in the motor. So no harm, no foul that there was no racing this season, I guess. Okay. But um, yeah, so we'll have two racing next year and then my littlest one again who's seven went out for a ride with sean uh when we were at that testing day and came in grinning ear to ear wanting to know when he could race daddy's class so he's got it now so, too. <laughs> yep <laughs> <laughs> and how fast are these boats going so uh the j class which was our junior class which my son will be racing um they go about 40 miles an hour and okay. my husband's class goes about 65 somewhere in there wow. All um, right. there are ones that go faster there are ones you know they're they're across the board um, my husband knows he's not allowed to race one that goes faster because when okay. those boats blow over they break into a million pieces yes so. <laughs> yeah i think we've all we've all seen uh, those videos so yeah. maybe uh, probably a good idea there Right. Um, you guys like to travel as well. You've been to the Grand Canyon. What, what are some of the other favorite places you've been to? So we actually just got home two days ago. Um, I'm obviously work from home. My husband in his field, he's currently working from home. And we pulled our kids to do virtual learning. And we rented a camper. And we social distanced in our own little bubble and traveled across the country. We made it all the way to California and made it back on Sunday. So wow. we, uh, we saw a lot of things. But we constantly want to go places. I mean, we were jonesing to go to Europe, but COVID. So we'll see when people in the United States are allowed to travel <laughs> outside the United States again. Um, but we just, we love to see things. We love the experiences, you know, we'll, yeah. we would live in a one bedroom little house if it meant we could see the world. So that's just kind of how we, how we roll. <laughs> Very cool. Um, you're also into photography. Uh, mm -hmm. so being that photo kid and even in your yearbook for your future plans, uh, back in uh, 2002, you had that you were going to teach until you were tired of it, and then you were going to switch to photography. I vividly remember that line. I don't know what <laughs> else was in there, but I vividly remember that line. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I just do it as a hobby. I've got a nice um, camera that I'll take out and landscape shots, like when we were at the Grand Canyon, I brought mm -hmm. it out there and was taking pictures. Um, I just, you know, especially now that we live at the beach, I love taking the camera down there, sunrise, sunset, kids playing. Yeah. It's just, it's something that it's just, it's enjoying for me. And it's great to look back on them too. You have a, mm -hmm. a record of what you've done. Right. Um, you and your husband are also big fans of the band 311. Still so, are, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, uh, pre and post COVID going to concerts for them. Yes. So, I mean... I don't even know how many Sean has been to at this point. I mean, I'm probably close to almost 50 shows oh, at this wow. point. So he's like way beyond me because he got me into them. But at this point, we've like met them a couple of times. Um, cool. They recognize us in a crowd. You know, nice. we're like we're like those old groupies. But everybody in the crowd now is kind of our age. Right. So it's a little <laughs> less than it used to be back yeah. in the day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we still... Still going to shows, still enjoying ourselves. Have the kids gone to any shows? They have not. So yeah, they're they're Jones and to go to their first show too. But we're like, we're just we just sweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no rush. Right. Um, what other plans for the future? Yeah, professionally, personally, what do you think? 
So we are in an awesome spot right now. So Sean worked, um, he moved into healthcare. He kind of took a little while to figure out what he wanted to be when he grew up. But he moved into healthcare and he became um, one of the high level administrators of the orthopedics department at the University of Pennsylvania before okay. we moved. But we knew we wanted to come here. And, you know, so he actually commuted back and forth for a little while, which um, it got old, but it, you know, it worked out. And now he does, um, I kind of want to say like healthcare consulting with different hospitals around the country. Okay. So we're in a spot now where I'm still building my business. He works right next to me, which um, took a little bit of adjustment. <laughs> <laughs> we work very, very differently. Um, but you know, we're, we're here now and just this, we're enjoying this particular season of our life. What the long-term future holds, I don't know, but we're enjoying the short term right now, so. Great, living in the moment. Yes. Terrific. Well, Jennifer, it's been great catching up with you and uh, congratulations on all your success since your time at Shawnee and we wish you all the best in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks. And that's all for this episode of Where Are They Now? For other Lenape District alumnus interviews, check us out online at youtube.com slash Lenape District TV. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.